This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. As we continue our discussion, bring you part two of our discussion with immigrant rights leader Fernando Garcia. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to the U.S.-Mexico border as Defense Secretary Jim Mattis travels to McAllen, Texas, today to visit some of the thousands of troops deployed there by President Trump. Nearly 6,000 active-duty troops are currently stationed in Texas, California and Arizona, following Trump's escalating attacks against the Central American caravan heading toward the U.S.-Mexico border. The Daily Beast is reporting that ICE is currently imprisoning an all-time high of 44,000 people. The figure is 4,000 more people than Congress has granted funding for ICE to hold. ICE and the Department of Homeland Security have not responded to requests to explain where the additional money is coming from. The Washington Post is reporting that President Trump is preparing to oust Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. Nielsen came, came under intense fire this summer over the, over the administration's family separation policy, with Democratic lawmakers demanding her resignation. This comes as new court filings show there are still 171 children separated from their families in U.S. custody, more than four months after a judge ordered the Trump administration to reunite all families that were separated at the U.S.-Mexico border. So we're continuing our conversation with Fernando Garcia, founding director of the Border Network for Human Rights, an advocacy group based in El Paso, Texas, who is here to be honored by the group Witness at a large gala tonight. Juan? Uh, well, Fernando, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the, the caravans as they're moving forward uh, from through Guatemala, in, uh, through Mexico now, and uh, the response of the Mexican government uh, to the folks who are crossing their country? Well, at first, I mean, we need to understand that there is, I believe that there is a vacuum in Mexico right now because the old government is essentially leaving in, in few in few weeks. Probably the, the Peña Nieto government is, is going to be gone. And then there's the new López Obrador government coming into uh, the government. So I think uh, there is a vacuum. Uh, there is there is an absence of a policy of how to deal with issues of, of, of the caravan and, and on immigration in Mexico. We had seen a couple of things, though. I mean, the one, the one thing that we heard is that the migrants were attacked by police at the, at the Guatemala-Mexico border. I think there were there were some incidents where uh, there are uh, reported human rights violations already. So I think uh, that was the initial response of the Mexican government. It seems that it seems that since then there has not been any, any major incident. But the other thing that had happened is is that the civil society is the one that had responded it very well. I mean the NGOs, the uh, the churches, and the, from different denominations they can forward, they came forward to actually support uh, the caravan and the immigrants and, and, and their families. It's important also to say that, uh, that the decision for them to come together in a caravan, these, Im these immigrants or migrants, uh, it was very organic. I mean, it was not a, a political decision. It's because in the numbers, uh, they feel more, more safe, I mean, because the journey, it, it is very dangerous. I mean, they, they are being extorted by corrupt police in Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador. They are gangs. They are uh, robbers. I mean, they go through a very difficult journey to come to the United States. So they decided to come together because in numbers they feel safe. So I think that's the reason why the caravan was created. Uh, we know already that some members of the caravans, of the first caravan, because there are several caravans already, they reached the, the U.S.-Mexico border already, uh, especially in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. And talk about who organized uh, these caravans. Well, I don't think there's, there's like a one organization putting it together. I think there's, I, I, I believe that the, the Trump, the Trump uh, administration, they want to blame somebody to actually organize, to organize this caravan. Well, it's not true. It came very, it came very organically, as I explained. I mean, even without the caravan, pe people would still come to the United States because the the force that is that is pushing them from their, from their country is stronger than that. I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the the recent elections here now with a Democratic majority uh, in in Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Democratic leaders are already uh, preparing their priorities, mm -hmm. and remarkably. Uh, 
dealing with immigration is not one of them. I've not and, seen it. And though. I wanted to uh, ask you about that. Given the, how much they protested what the Trump administration was doing, that mm -hmm. the Democratic leadership mm -hmm. is now not even mentioning uh, immigration reform as one of its priorities. Oh, that, that is disappointing. Let, let, let me say that because many of the, sh the issues continue happening. You just mentioned that there were like some separated children from families that had not been reunited. Well, let me tell you, right now in Tornillo, Texas, uh, there are close more than 2,000 children in detention already. So the Trump administration doubled down on the, in, on the incarceration of children. The border wall is still being constructed. The, the zero tolerance operation is still in place. So they are criminalizing people that is coming through. The deportations are a, a historic high at this point. So I cannot understand why the Democrats are not taking this as a major issue, not only to push back on that, but really have a, a discussion on immigration reform. I mean, how do we actually now grab this moment where they will have at least the majority on the House to have a substantive discussion about how to how do we deal with immigration? And they are not doing it. Not to mention that the fate of the dreamers has not yet been fully resolved. No, and, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I think there are 700,000 dreamers right now that they don't know what is going to happen. I, I think there was a clear mandate by uh, by, by the people to the Democrats. I mean, they rejected it, the anti-immigrant rhetoric of uh, Trump, and, and, and they want the Democrats to do something different. I mean, that's really important, because you have, in the lead-up to the midterms, Donald Trump uh, threatening uh, migrants, saying any migrants throwing rocks at soldiers along the border could be shot. Well, let's go to what he said. We're not going to put up with that. They want to throw rocks at our military. Our military fights back. We're going to consider, and I tell them, consider it a rifle. When they throw rocks like they did at the Mexico military and police, I say, consider it a rifle. That was President Trump. And at the same time, as you were saying, it seems like the midterm elections were a complete repudiation of this uh, rhetoric. And you have a lot of firsts going into Congress. For example, the first two Latina Congress member from Texas. Um, you have uh, Sylvia Garcia and Veronica Escobar. Um, Early on Election Day, in Escobar's district, which is where you are, in El Paso, the U.S. Border Patrol initiated an unannounced crowd control exercise, only to immediately cancel it because there was such outcry. This was on Election Day? Yeah, yeah. They, actually, we were there. I mean, we were, uh, we were surprised, because I think we saw this as a border su uh, suppression action, because they wanted to do that dog and pony show about crowd control. On the election day, on, on, the, on, on the morning of, of that Tuesday, uh, they wanted to create this a scenario that there's a lot of danger and, fe and fear of uh, invaders at the border. Which none of that is true. I mean, let's be very clear. None of these pieces of the agenda, at least not of, none of the rhetoric about the border or the rhetoric about immigrants, the bad hombres, the criminals, the m Middle Easterns, that is not true. However, I mean, the, the climate is being set up in a way that now we have soldiers uh, that they are not trained to deal with, with civilian population. I mean, they are trained to actually shoot uh, and go to war. And the question is why they are there. I mean, who, they, who is the enemy here? And obviously the enemy, in this case, it seems that the children are the enemy or the immigrants and refugees are the enemy. This is setting up an important precedent, because if we accept the militarization of the border the way that is happening, I think we will accept that in the future anywhere in America. I, I think this is a very dangerous, dangerous uh, decision by the president. And if we don't push back, if the Democrats don't push on that, I think we're going to have the risk of having a, uh, in the future the, the militarization of New York City, of Los Angeles. So I think we need to be very careful about what we need, uh, what do we do next. Can you give us an update on uh, the Tornillo Detention Center, where undocumented children are being held, the facility set for expansion to 4,000 beds, and this latest judge rules all families have to be reunited, but still we hear more than 140 kids are still separated well, from listen, their parents? Listen, this is, uh, I mean, uh, it's just so many things happening at the same time, and it's, 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 we never had that many things happening at the border in with in this unprecedented aggression against immigrants, never in the, in, 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 the, in the past. But in the case of Tornillo, I think that reflects the expansion of detention facilities in America. 
Uh, obviously, some people is making money out of it. Uh, and, and we know that there are the private companies pushing for these detention centers. Uh, uh, but but it, I think what is dramatic, if, if you would ask me, like a year ago, if we would end up with a policy that would separate children from mothers and I will tell you no, because this is America, right? That's, that, that we, we, we embrace liberty, freedom, and all of these things that you know. And however, it did happen. We have children, 18-year-old, uh, uh, 18 months old babies separated from their parents. So I think this was, this was ridiculous. And apparently, there was a, a decision by the president, an executive decision, to stop that. Well, it did not. We still have children that had been that are still separated, more than a hundred children. But also, they, they doubled down on that. Now, Tornillo, it is conditioned to have all, up to four thousand children in detention. We had more than two thousand already there. So I think, the, I mean, we never had so many children incarcerated. These are not daycare centers. These are jails. These are detention centers. I mean that. Uh, it, I mean, it reminds us of. Uh, of those, uh, the Second World War concentration camps in America. At the same time, they are planning to have four police and good fellow, two military bases in, in Texas, to be expanded to actually host, uh, to uh, have more than 7,000 immigrant families there. I, I want to ask you with the response of the Com the border community residents themselves, because uh, you come from uh, uh, El Paso, the, I think the city with the highest percentage of Latinos of any yeah. any major yeah. city in the country. Uh, 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 towns like McAllen and Brownsville, these are all towns 65, 70 percent Latino. And what is the reaction of those U.S. citizen uh, Latino residents of the border to what's going on there? Let me be very frank. There are, there are some people at the border, even some Latinos, that they believe this anti-immigrant anti -immigrant rhetoric. I mean, it seems that they've forgotten what they, where they came from, right? I mean, but the vast majority, the vast majority of our community, local elected officials, faith-based organizations, county officials at the border, they have actually shown a tremendous solidarity towards these families and towards uh, children. I think uh, in El Paso, we organized like major mobilizations. Uh, we closed uh, the International Bridge. We actually cl closed a nice detention center uh, massively because I think it, it was undignified. This, this is un-American what is happening. So people feel like that because this is not only impacting immigrants and immigrants coming into the country, but this is impacting the border and, and border residents having uh, soldiers in your backyard. It is not the American way of doing things. And having these dog and pony shows of uh, the Border Patrol and soldiers uh, creating fear in our communities, that is not the way to go. I mean, they, they, they believe that the playing with fear is going to immobilize people and that we're not going to do anything. Well, it's happening the opposite. El Paso had one of the highest, actually, hi uh, historic record of uh, border turnout. And we, that's how we got uh, 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 the first Latina elected from Texas to, to Congress, with a lot of expectations. Veronica first Escobar, two the first two Latinas, one in Houston and the second one in El Paso. I think that is unprecedented. And that's because Latinos in Texas, Beto O'Rourke was just three points away from Cruz. And this is, this is a very conservative state. I mean, at least they thought it was conservative. And Beto O'Rourke ran with a very liberal pro-immigrant agenda and almost won Texas. So something is happening on the ground. It's not only fear, but actually people is getting upset and people is getting organized and people is coming out. So I think I have hopes that, 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 that things are going to change. And I, and I hope that, 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 that the immigration is going to be resolved in a much better way than we're doing it right now. Now, what about Beto O'Rourke's defeat? Well, he's from El Paso, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, as uh, Cruz tried to point out, you know, he's not the Latino one here, right? <laughs> and that he's trying to masquerade as one with his name Beto, and then he's showing a shirt his mother had sewn in his nickname when he was four years old, being Beto. But— the significance of his position—he yeah. goes from a Congress member with almost no yeah. chance of winning to coming within the percentage points of unseating Cruz. What does this mean after the midterms? What—do you consider it a total defeat? 
Well, you know, I, I think as, a, as an organization, NGO, uh, we don't actually go for Democrats or Republicans. Let me say that. I mean, we need to actually be very neutral about it. But le also, let me tell you that we know Beto and Veronica uh, way back in our community. So I think uh, they do represent many of the values of our border community. Uh, I think they had grasped uh, this idea that this border uh, the U.S.-Mexico border represents, uh, in a positive way, the new Ellis Island for America. It is. It is because the, the aspirations of these immigrants coming through this border, it is the same aspirations and hopes that people had in New York City back uh, a thousand, uh, a, a hundred years ago, when they came to Ellis Island fleeing persecution, poverty. Isn't it Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty created the idea of, the ideal of America? So I think that's what we want to actually do. We want to continue saying that instead of militarizing the border, that that border is going to be the moment of opportunity. So um, in that sense, I would say that Beto and Veronica, uh, in, in, in they represented they represented those values, and the fact that Beto ran with this liberal platform in Texas. And he was just three points away from Cruz. It represents that something is happening on the ground. That Texas is not as conservative as they thought. And I don't think that this was really a defeat. I mean, really, I mean, this, this was a victory in many ways. I wanted to ask you about the, uh, again, uh, uh, seeing the, the, the what, uh, your relation to um, El Paso and uh, obviously what is a much bigger city yeah, across yeah. the border. If one day Mexico shut down the border, mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, the amount people have no idea the amount of traffic commerce <laughs> that goes back and forth across these bridges every day, mm -hmm. the tr the lines of trucks that go back and forth to produce uh, to ship goods from Mexico into the United States, uh, and uh, if you could talk about the impact, uh, the economic impact uh, of the border on the United States. And the social impact and the family impact. You know, Trump has proposed that, right? This, he has said that he's going to shut down the border. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, we had, we had like a thousands and thousands of people in cars and trucks. I mean, th th these, uh, these port of entries at the border, they are vital for the American economy. Texas is one of the largest uh, partners with Mexico in terms of uh, economic uh, trade and economic development. So it, 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 they are not going to do that. I mean, I believe, I hope that they, can, they are not going to do that because America has a, a lot to lose about, about doing that. So I, I, I believe that, uh, again, that this is, this is a false rhetoric, that, uh, that things that Trump is, is trying to actually present is not happening. However, what I believe is that we are, we are having a moment of discussion about what the United States is going to be in 50 years. I mean, uh, we're going to be a militarized society where we incarcerate children and immigrants and whoever is diverse, or we're going to accept that America it is, it is a different society now, that is not as white as it was before, that, and that we embrace, embrace that diversity. And that is the future of America. So I, I think there is an ideological battle happening today. I wanted to ask you about what's happening at the White House right now. As we speak, it looks like Kirsten Nielsen is about to be thrown mm -hmm. out as mm -hmm. head of Department of Homeland Security. Actually, word had it at the time of um, uh, the Trump uh, President Trump making sure the children were ripped away from their parents, mm -hmm. that she was against that, but then she certainly threw her weight behind it. Um, and John Kelly, the chief of staff, uh, she was his protege, General John Kelly who was the head of Department of Homeland Security, and before that, the head of SOUTHCOM, Southern Command, mm -hmm. um, you know, in charge of that whole border area. Mm -hmm. Talk about their effect. Does it matter? Is it only Trump's position that matters, or are they shaping policy as well? And what does it mean that they're being forced out? Well, you know, it only shows how dysfunctional the Trump administration is, and it also shows how— uh, Trump is trying to reshape his cabinet, obviously, with this reshuffling. But I don't think he's doing it for for, for good. I mean, I don't think he's shaping it to say, now we're going to be less anti-immigrant and that we're going to change the rhetoric. Probably they are doing it for the worst, unfortunately. And when you heard Trump speaking after the elections, 
it seems that he doesn't regret anything. I think he's doubling down on all of these false, false, uh, false arguments. Uh, he's doubling down on the caravan issue. He he con continues to say that we're we're going to mili militarize the border even more. I mean, promising 15,000 more soldiers. I think that reshuffle, it might not be f for good. That, uh, we don't know where, where this is going to end, but I think, uh, I don't believe, and we don't trust the administration at this point. And finally, you're head and you founded the Border Network for Human Rights in El Paso. As you just said, you've never seen so much happening there on the border. How does it affect your work? Well, we have more work. I mean, that, that what I say is that we have uh, we have been working in in the last two years. Uh, we've been working uh, actually 24 hours a day because we've been one thing after the other. I mean, we had the dreamers issue, then we had the family separation, now the, the construction of the border wall, then the deportation issues, the violation of human rights by border patrol, the deployment of the military. So I think it is, it is not how hard one thing is, is that many things are happening at the same time. Um, so it, it has taken a toll on us. I mean, obviously our community is responding. I'm, I'm very proud of our organization, but also I'm very proud of our community at the border. I mean, we had organized uh, vigils, marches, uh, uh, advocacy meetings. Uh, co we're building a coalition. I think there's a lot of work that we have done. If there's any silver lining on this, is that we're getting more prepared and more organized, and, uh, and, and, and we're resisting. I mean, I think that, that was the last two years, we're essentially building the resistance against these racist, anti-immigrant uh, strategies of the president. With thousands of U.S. soldiers going to the border, being sent there by Trump. Um, are you also concerned that there will be increased militias on the border? It is already happening, because part of the message, part of the rhetoric of, of, of the president, I believe, is a call to arms. I mean, there is there's this, this nationalistic, xenophobic, white supremacist uh, base that actually is responding to that. Uh, we had now the news and, and notice already that there are uh, militia groups like the Minutemen uh, coming to Texas, uh, to New Mexico, and to Arizona. So I think uh, we're going to see more civilian and uh, on ar civilian arm, mostly white people coming to the border uh, to help secure the border. I, I think that is very dangerous in many ways because. Uh, the, the, the president is promoting violence against minorities. Uh, uh, I mean, we had we had the case already of the of the Jewish temple. Um, in in I'm very concerned of what is going to be the interaction of these militias with migrants trying to cross the border. I mean, we can see uh, an, another uh, very dramatic incident uh, unfolding in, at the border. So I think I think. These are very dangerous times. I mean, in fact, the Jewish synagogue that was attacked a few weeks ago in Pittsburgh, um, Robert Bowers, the man who did this, who, uh, you know, tweeted, it wasn't on tweet, yeah. it was on something called Gab, right before attacking Hias, the Jewish organization that works on refugee resettlement and had held refugee Shabbats all over the country, including in that building, he cited that specifically as the source of his anger, calling immigrants, quoting Trump, calling them invaders. I mean, he's promoting hate. And he's prom promoting Who? Trump. Trump is promoting hate and, 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 as I say, he's promoting violence against minorities, against immigrants, uh, demonizing them. Uh, so he needs to be accountable. Trump needs to be accountable of this act of violence because uh, Jewish community is being very supportive of, uh, of, of refugees and asylums. And I think they were expressing that. And they have this incident. And I think. Uh, Clearly, I mean, clearly, this is the result of uh, of Trump rhetoric. I mean, let's remind ourselves that words matter, <coughs> and what he's saying and what he's promoting against immigrants, against minorities, having a consequence. In this case, a violent consequence. You've called what Trump is saying a call to arms. It is a call to arms. I mean, there's uh, people listening. I mean, what uh, people is getting 
to the border in masses right now. Uh, we had uh, reports that uh, close to Las Cruces, New, New Mexico, in Arizona, in the Texas Valley, there have been uh, militia types groups that have been deployed because they want to defend the country of the invader, defend the country from criminals. You know, again, we're talking about children, about mothers, about young people fleeing violence, and they are looking for protection in the United States. And now, in, in, on this side, we we see this rhetoric against them. So, and, and with potential, in this case, could potential scenarios of dramatic scenarios of people be shot at. You know. We want to thank you so much for being with us, Fernando Garcia, founding director of the Border Network for Human Rights, an advocacy group based in El Paso, Texas, being honored by the group Witness at their gala tonight. To see part one of our discussion, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.